Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a large-scale Neanderthal fat factory has been discovered in Germany, the oldest pterosaur in North America has been found, a new species of tree-climbing reptile from the Jurassic has been revealed, and much more. Our top story this week is the discovery that Neanderthals, our close extinct relatives, set up a large-scale fat factory in Germany 125,000 years ago. Here they processed at least 172 large mammals at the edge of a lake, extracting bone marrow and making lots of little bone fragments so that they could produce bone grease. This was intensive, organized, and strategic, according to archaeologist Lutz Kindler. And the Neanderthals clearly transported the carcasses of their prey animals from other locations to the specific site where they had set up for this particular task. The animals they were processing primarily included horses, deer, and bovids such as aurochs, the wild ancestors of cattle, with many of their bones found at this site in Germany preserving telltale signs of human-inflicted cut marks. The extraction of within-bone fats and grease would have been important for hunter-gatherers such as these Neanderthals, who were mostly eating animal foods, as they provided a crucial resource to sustain them through more challenging times, such as winter, and would also have helped prevent a condition known as rabbit starvation, or protein toxicity. This condition can occur when consuming high amounts of protein over a sustained period of time, as waste compounds from protein metabolism can become quite debilitating or even lethal. Therefore, they would have needed calories from non-protein sources, such as fats. The establishment of this site and an operation of this scale adds to the growing evidence that Neanderthals were intelligent people capable of complex activities. Remarkably, the dating of this site suggests that they were rendering fat from bones around 100,000 years before the oldest evidence of our own species doing the same. Producing bone grease in particular would have been a time-consuming process, as they had to make smaller bone flakes, boil them, and then skim the grease off the surface once the water cooled. According to another archaeologist who investigated the site, bone grease production requires a certain volume of bones to make this labor-intensive processing worthwhile, and hence the more bones assembled, the more profitable it becomes. Clearly, these fascinating ancient humans planned ahead and deliberately brought all these kills to this one site, where a fairly major operation was set up to help them access these vital resources for their survival. Neanderthals continue to become more intriguing with every new study. What an incredible discovery. In other ancient news, there's been a very exciting discovery in Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona, as an ancient bone bed dating to 210 million years ago has been found, which preserves the oldest known pterosaur in all of North America. The pterosaurs, the lineage of flying reptiles that coexisted with the dinosaurs, first appeared about 228 million years ago, and their early evolution remains somewhat of a mystery. This new species has been named Eotephrodactylus macintyre, meaning ash-winged dawn goddess, named after Suzanne McIntyre, who discovered the fossil. This animal was tiny and likely fed on small fish with its sharp little teeth. Not only does it shed light on early pterosaur diversity, but it also would have coexisted with an intriguing mix of creatures, as indicated by the other fossils present in the bone bed. The site is unusual, containing a combination of groups that would become significant parts of later ecosystems, such as frogs, turtles, and small reptiles, alongside much more archaic lineages that originated earlier in the Triassic and would die out a few million years later such as trilophosaurid reptiles, the semi-aquatic phytosaurs, and itosaurs. So this remarkable assemblage offers a snapshot of a unique time in Earth's history, when these animals were crossing over. Before the mass extinction at the end of the Triassic, about 201 million years ago, significantly altered the course of history. There's more brilliant news for pterosaur fans next, as the first direct evidence for herbivorous pterosaurs has just been discovered. These flying reptiles were incredibly diverse in their anatomy and lifestyles, but most pterosaurs likely fed on animals. Nonetheless, herbivory has been suggested as a possibility in some pterosaur lineages, namely members of the family Tapijaridae. However, these suggestions were based solely on anatomical inferences, as some species appeared to have jaws similar in shape to modern fruit-eating parrots, and they may have been capable of cracking open seeds too. Now, a species of tapijarid from China named Sinopterus has been found with preserved stomach contents, 
Among these contents are phytoliths, tiny mineral fragments found in the tissues of some plants that fossilize very well. It looks like some of these phytoliths came from woody plants, some from ferns, and some from flowering plants, indicating that these pterosaurs fed on a broad range of vegetation. The Sinopterus fossil also contains gastroliths, stones that were swallowed to aid in food grinding within the stomach, which are commonly associated with herbivory. Additionally, the absence of bone fragments or scales from other animals seems to suggest it was not just a generalist feeder, but possibly a dedicated herbivore. What an exciting find. More prehistoric reptile news up next, as a new species of tree-climbing Jurassic reptile has been discovered in Germany. Coming from the Solnhofen limestones, rocks that were deposited in what was once an archipelago environment, the fossils of this new species had actually been known for many decades. The fossil was found as a part and a counterpart, due to how the limestone layers split, and the main part had been held in a museum in Germany and labelled as another species. Meanwhile, the counterpart, which preserves more of the skeleton, was rediscovered in the London Natural History Museum in 2022. The two pieces were therefore reunited and recognised as a new species, now called Sphenodraco scandentis. Sphenodraco was a kind of reptile called a rhynchocephalian. These are different from lizards, and today only one species of rhynchocephalian survives, the Tuatara of New Zealand. In the past, however, they were far more diverse, and Sphenodraco proves this since the small reptile was found to have extremely long limbs that would have made it an excellent tree climber. So Sphenodraco is an exciting discovery, and is the first identified fully tree-living rhynchocephalian known to science. Also in the recent paleo news, paleontologists have looked inside a damaged rib bone of a T-Rex and learned more about how the tyrant reptiles would have healed from their injuries. Looking at a rib from the specimen known as Scotty, a particularly big and robust individual, scientists CT scans this bone and examined all the little blood vessels that could be seen within it, while also chemically analysing the molecules in the structures to understand how they were preserved. They also created impressive 3D models of the blood vessels that were formed when the bone healed, as increased blood flow to the region occurred. This research is fascinating because it combines innovative techniques and the authors suggest it could open new avenues of study into how other types of dinosaurs recovered from their injuries. In other news, one of the most common solid materials floating around our universe is ice, but the structure of this low-density amorphous ice has been somewhat of a mystery. This week, a paper published in the journal Physical Review B has used computer simulations to reveal that this cosmic material is not quite as random and disordered as the word amorphous would suggest. Instead, it contains tiny crystals, really tiny, only slightly wider than a strand of DNA. The structure is still mostly amorphous, just not fully, so these crystals are embedded within an otherwise disordered structure. Ice is involved in a wide variety of cosmological processes, pushing the formation of planets and the evolution of galaxies. Understanding how the most common form of ice looks like atomically can be very important for understanding how our universe shapes itself. For example, this model for the structure of low-density amorphous ice makes panspermia less likely. Panspermia is the idea that the building blocks of life were transported to Earth on an ice comet, but whilst that comet having tiny crystals doesn't make panspermia impossible, it does massively decrease the likelihood of it, as there are fewer places within the ice that these building blocks can exist. And finally for this week, remarkable video footage of two orcas apparently kissing has recently made the news. The video was taken in October 2024 by a snorkeler using a GoPro, whilst snorkeling in a sheltered bay in a fjord in northern Norway. The footage shows two adult-sized orcas engaging in a mouth-to-mouth -mouth interaction that lasted for a total of 1 minute and 49 seconds. There were three distinct episodes of kissing, the first lasting 10 seconds, the second episode lasting 26 seconds, and the third 18 seconds. After the final episode, the individual separated and swam away. Although the video footage is taken at a distance, so it is difficult to see the tongue and mouth movements, the overall behavioural pattern corresponds to something that's also been documented in captive orcas who have engaged in the same behaviour. The first description of this behaviour was in 1978, and the second was in 2013, when video footage was also recorded. In this video, one orca can clearly be seen protruding its tongue, while the other makes gentle nibbling movements. Researchers are interpreting tongue nibbling as a means of reinforcing social bonds, particularly among orcas that are not yet involved in adult behaviours such as mating or dominance competition. The fact that this behaviour has been seen in orcas who were bred in captivity with parents from different geographical regions also suggests that tongue nibbling is not a population-specific behaviour, 
but rather a widely distributed behaviour within the species. What incredible observations! Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at 7 at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Cowam, Chippy Chippy Chappa Chappa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drov Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Mac Randis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Pripajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikus, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.